Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Natalie McDermott as our first female speaker on stage this week. As you may know, women in technology is one of the themes that Campus Party is about. So please welcome Natalie, who is the founder of On Road Media in London. Thank you. Um, hi, so there's five of us. Um, I'm Natalie, what's your name? H Day. And you? Jonathan, great. Um, so I've been asked to come here and talk about what On Road does. We're a social enterprise that works with misrepresented groups in the UK. So we work with groups that are at the very, very margins of society. So they're either misrepresented because of who they are or what they do or where they come from. Is that your guy's background or what's your, how come you're interested in this talk? Uh, the, the subject of trans issues is something that, that I find quite interesting, not to me personally, but I have several friends who are either gender queer or trans, and it's okay. a field that I'm certainly quite interested in. Great. How about you? I'm part of a dance group that is um, trans friendly, um, lots of guys and girls and gender queer and it's, it's also, I'm here because of the terminology, I don't know how to refer to people at, at all, so I'm hoping I'm going to learn a lot. Okay, fantastic, great. So we've got a small but dedicated group of people, fantastic. Um, so. Um, basically, um, what I'm going to do today is, is talk about how we use digital technology in order to get a group like the trans community into the big media, into mainstream media. How do we change that? Um, social media obviously runs through everything we do. So it's not like this kind of, we've got this kind of special, funky way of using social media. What we do though is we know who we're, we know our community really well. Um, we've built up a huge amount of trust with the trans community. And we have excellent contacts in uh, the press and in the media. And we use the web and other ways of getting through to them and bringing those two groups together. So this project is a really good example of how that, that happens. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, my background is um, I set up On Road in 2005. Um, I was a journalist at the BBC. And I used to be a news producer. And I remember thinking, you know, it's, it's a very small group of people that decides what gets told in the news. And there's no secret about that. Usually white, middle class, the usual, very well educated, male, <laughs> exactly. Um, and that really frustrated me. So I knew I wanted to do something that was, in, was journalism related, but that looked at bringing groups that aren't uh, represented in, into that kind of sphere. So I got a job in a prison, and I worked in Wandsworth Prison for three years, teaching prisoners how to make documentaries about crime. Um, we didn't have access to the web, but what we were doing basically was citizen journalism. We were involving people who had first-hand experience of what it was like to commit crime, and they were the ones who were producing the content about crime. So the content, therefore, ended up being much more hard-hitting. And that led for me to set up On Road, which works with all sorts of different groups to produce their own media, but also crucially to influence the influencers, the ones who make the big decisions in the media. Now, th there are two key things that need to change. One, we need more diversity in the media, and that work happens, and it happens over here. The other thing is we need to influence people who are already in the media, decision makers, to start changing programming. And we work mostly in this area because we think we can pack a punch quicker. And the reason why we do that is the communities that we work with are struggling now. So they're communities that are suffering now. Um, so that's our kind of our, our uh, reason for being, is working with those who are experiencing serious social problems on the ground, where you can make a direct correlation between those problems and how they're represented in the media. And that's where we do our, our work. Um, so, how did I get involved with the trans community? Well, all journalists have an entry point to a story. Um, once those journalists have that entry point, and it could be because something dramatic has happened to them, or they've read about something, or they've traveled and visited a country and they're passionate about Iran or whatever it is, those entry points are what make journalists sit up and listen. 
my entry point to the trans community was in 2011, I was at King's Cross Station waiting for a train on the Piccadilly line, and I witnessed the death of a woman who was pushed in front of a train. Um, obviously, that was very traumatic, but in the days following her death, I could see in the press that actually she was a transgender woman. She had been a very prolific immigration lawyer, like changed the face of immigration law in the country for the better. But she was reduced to a kind of deviant sort of prostitute with dating profiles and very little was paid attention to her being an immigration lawyer until a lot later. And I remember thinking, wow, I know absolutely nothing about this community and it's amazing how little protection they have. So if you look at this headline, we see sex change passenger admits pushing cross-dressing person. And if we replace sex change with gay or lesbian, we don't do that anymore. Um, but the trans community, you're basically allowed to put that in the headline, you know, as if it's a, a detail to the story. And that got me thinking. Now, you guys know something about trans people because you work with them. Um, so how do you... you or you, you dance with them, you dance with them. So, so how do you describe what a trans person is? Um, well, it, it, until recently, uh, the way it's written is trans asterisk, and I'd been calling them trans sparkly. <laughs> and they yeah. were in my... And the, um, our dance um, teacher was like, no, that's just to cover all trans people. But I, I understand it to be like people that aren't identifying with, it's something about like cis female and cis yeah. male, about what their body is saying, like their physical attributes versus yeah. what's going on mentally. Yeah. And I'm probably really not making that beautifully coherent, but that's... That's kind of that sounds pretty clear. Okay, yeah. awesome. How about you? How would you describe a trans person to someone who doesn't know? Uh, I think the the easiest and simplest definition that I could possibly foster would be simply that someone do, that does not adhere to the gender binary in yeah. any such way. Exactly, exactly. So, and there are about three hundred thousand people in the UK who are gender variant of that description. The average age someone understands that they're trans or feels that they're different is around seven. 34% uh, of the trans community have attempted suicide at least once. The, the rates are stupidly high. The reasons for those, as I discovered, was that if you open the newspaper or put on the television, um, trans people are mostly described as deviant, sexual deviants, or as deceivers. So they, they are people who are trying to deceive someone into having sex. Um, that's usually what we see in the films, that it's the trans woman typically trying to deceive a man into having sex, and then there's the big reveal, and that person is the subject of abuse. In the press, then, you have a lot of people who are monstered and outed. And so for a young person growing up as trans, you know, it's a pretty scary world out there, if that's how you're, you're described. So what we did is we organized a social media workshop with uh, 10 trans activists just to see what they were doing with the web and how they were communicating with the media. And we saw two major problems there. One, the community is so angry and so, and, and justifiably so, but online, when a journalist gets it wrong, even if it's not out of malice, but it's just out of ignorance, that journalist historically was bombarded with abuse. And what all that did was alienate people further and make them think they were just this community that couldn't be sort of dealt with. The other big problem is that we have very ignorant journalists who know nothing about trans people and who don't feel obliged at all to learn anything about trans people. But then the opportunities we have, one is that trans people in general, it's a generalization, are brilliant at using the web. They use the internet all the time to document their journeys often. Because when you open a paper or put on the television and you don't see a reflection of yourself in the media, often your impulse is to actually create your own. So we have loads of people producing excellent videos about their transition and helping each other that way. The other opportunity is that there are fantastic stories within the trans community because it's not just interesting to transition. Um, these people do everything. They're you know, lawyers and actors and all sorts of different uh, uh, jobs. But the, the actual um, process of transitioning and going through that with your family 
we want to tell the media there are loads of really interesting positive stories around how people transition and to transition is a wonderful thing. So those were our opportunities. So what we did is we organized a social innovation camp uh, to start off the work. Are you familiar with what an innovation camp is? No? Um, what a camp is, is that it brings together techie people, so people who are developers and designers, together with people who are experiencing a problem, and they try and fix that problem. Much like a hackathon, but a hackathon would be very techy. A social innovation camp focuses much more on the problem itself, so looking at the community, bringing them into the camp, and looking at problems they're facing and building teams around those problems. So we ran an innovation camp at Channel 4 about a year, uh, two years ago um, in order to start the work, to see where the opportunities were, to bring journalists together with developers and trans people and see if we could come up with some solutions as a group. Because key to this work was building trust within the community and not us leading this work. So we still haven't led it. We've coordinated work, but we haven't led it. I'm just going to show you a quick video about what TransCamp is. TransCamp is a social innovation camp that we're running with the trans community. So, and by trans, we mean transgender or transsexual. And we're looking at ways that we can improve how the media portrays and treats trans people. TransCamp is a really important part of our transgender work that we're doing here at Channel 4. But in order to kind of advance our own journey in um, getting this right and really truly representing the people we purport to represent, um, we have to have things like TransCamp. So we've boiled down some of the most important issues to work on to five problems and they've got the day to delve into the problem, work out some solutions and come up with an idea of how we could tackle it using digital uh, technology. The question that I was given today is the fact that um, people are not aware of the existence of trans children and how can we change that. One of the main things that I want to try and pursue is to try and stop bullying. I was beat up, spat on. There was one instance where I was in a ginnel behind my house, like an alleyway, and I was beat up by two 40-year-old men just because I was trans, and I was 14 at the time. One great thing I think that's happening today is, yes, you've got a lot of trans people who represent their different walks of life, but you've got a lot of people who come from different social groups who are providing solutions. We want to put a resource out there that parents will um, be able to access, but we wanted really to target parents who are dealing with a gender variant child and to try and help them. We're looking today at um, how families react to people coming out and what we want to put together is a web resource that allows the family to go and have a look at what it's about. The presentations were great. I mean, it's, it's really interesting because each of the issues they were talking about were really important and just as important as each other. So in a way, it was difficult to kind of judge between the importance of the issue they were tackling and the actual idea itself. But the winner of TransCamp, congratulations to... Tango! The winner of TransCamp was Trango. It was a really kind of clever way of looking at how much transphobic language is in the media. So it's kind of like a little app that you download and it's kind of a bingo for transphobic words. You've got to be out, you've got to, you've got to be visual, you've got to have these spaces. The more spaces you have, the more matter of fact it becomes. What I love about it is that it's a really positive thing for the trans community and there's so much negativity online. This is something very positive and forward thinking and I think that's important too for morale. So could you hear that? <laughs> so um, as I said at the end, the, it was doubly important to A, come up with some actual solutions that we could make into workable solutions and B, raise morale within the community by involving lots and lots of people and we did that. Uh, by involving people online, so we put out a video challenge and we asked trans people across the UK to record short videos of problems that they experienced with the media that were then played to all the journalists throughout the day as they were there and the developers. 
we involve people through Twitter and the usual social media kind of outlets. So a lot of people felt like they were involved with the event and not just a, a handful of people. Um, the actual uh, winners, so Trango was this bingo for transphobic words. And then the Trans Comedy Award, because there was a member of the BBC on a team, their idea was to actually use the web to try and find really funny comedy scripts involving trans people because comedy tends to be something which is actually really important. Um, we should be able to laugh at everyone in comedy, but it's about laughing in a way that isn't uh, uh, taking, sort of um, laughing at their existence. It's kind of making comedy around the situations they end up in. That's the difference. Now, comedy at the moment around trans people is laughing at their existence. So the Trans Comedy Award was saying, you know, the trans people that came said, no, we want people to laugh at us, like we laugh at other people, but we want it to be with understanding of who a trans person is and with respect. So the Comedy Award, sponsored by the BBC now, looks for good script writing about trans people online and then gives them an award, and then they produce it with script writers at the BBC. So the beauty of a camp is that when the solution is born, we don't run it. The people who come to the camp take it and run with it. So we've had some really interesting successes. Um, I'm not going to actually show, show you that video, but there's a, there's a whole um, list of, thing, of videos uh, that trans people produced uh, to show, because we can get to having a chat at the end, I think, a bit more quickly. So the other, one of the other things that um, happened as a result of this work is that Channel 4 suddenly realized we, we brought all these young trans people to the camp and they met all these fantastic young people and they commissioned My Transsexual Summer, which was the first mainstream series about transsexual people on television in the UK, which was amazing. And they mostly got it right in terms of treating them with respect. They did still look at things like surgery and stuff that trans people really kind of think are incidental. But on the whole, they, they, they got it right. And one of the things we did while this was running was if you have a primetime television show like this up and running, um, there's no better way to see what Joe Bloggs in the middle of England thinks about transgender people because you can see them on Twitter using the hashtag MyTranssexualSummer. So there's a whole stream of tweets, of transphobic tweets, and also tweets from people who, who didn't know anything and who were saying, wow, this is really interesting. I didn't realize that trans people were young, kind of thing. So we got volunteers online that we hadn't met who ended up, through while these shows were going live, tweeting to these people in the name of the project to say, if you want to learn more, go here. Thanks for your tweet. Even if it was transphobic, it was saying, thanks for your tweet, but we think you've got it wrong. Have a look here kind of thing. So in that way, we kind of were able to reach into, we had hundreds of volunteers doing this here, there, and everywhere. And we were able to do something that made people feel very positive about what, what was happening. Um, so community engagement is massive. Um, then we decided to, well, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, then we, uh, the second phase of the work then was about looking at how do we reach people like the Daily Mail, the Sun, BBC, etc. So what we did was we looked at what works in a, in a diversity workshop. And your typical diversity workshop ends up being people who have to go. So a BBC journalist will be forced to go to a, a diversity workshop. And it's tick box training. It's kind of what kind of language you should and shouldn't use and that kind of thing. So what we know what works from a workshop is when someone gets a chance to speak to someone face to face and they get information when they need it. So we design these interactions and interactions are where you approach a journalist and you say, we know you love golf. We'd love to take you for a coffee on a golf course uh, with a couple of young trans people. Uh, we don't want to talk about the media. We just want to actually just have an hour with you. This is who we are, kind of thing. So what we do is we run several of these interactions every month with specifically targeted people. And what happens as a result of these interactions, so we had that one was with Channel 4, this one was with the Daily Mail, who are big offenders, and this one was with the head of BBC Drama, so responsible for EastEnders, etc. And once these people have had a chance to empathize with young trans people, they tend to become champions of the work. 
And we have a, a, a several sort of step process to, to work. So we start with an invitation that tends to be personalized. We carry out the interaction. We have a follow-up. Our immediate results tend to be like they write an article or they do something quite quickly. And longer term results tend to happen with the journalist coming to you with an idea for a documentary or something like that. Um, this is the way we've been able to get the Daily Mail to change their behavior, by simply sitting down with someone and having lunch with them. Now, which sounds like a very simple thing to do, but the whole way it's framed is really positive and constructive. And then the, the, the way we kind of re get that sort of the benefit of those interactions out to as wide an audience as possible is we do a mix of email and social media following up afterwards. And we make sure that the community itself are involved with publicizing the, the efforts that we're making so the community feels like something is happening. Um, and yeah, you'll see by the end of it, we have pretty, some pretty good results. I'll just show you some of the results now. Um, stuff like this. Um, I don't know if you were, if you saw the Bradley Chelsea Manning story a couple of weeks ago. So the Wik WikiLeaks, the the guy who, sorry, the guy who who, who leaked information to uh, about the U.S. government as Bradley Manning uh, came out as transgender when she was sentenced, and her name is Chelsea. Now. After our interaction with the Daily Mail, this guy, this journalist, tweeted saying, thanks to my training, I can confirm the Independent and the Mail Online have got the Manning story right. BBC is all over the place, basically, with the pronouns. And this guy, Tom Peck, goes on to, to berate the BBC. He tweets to the BBC uh, journalist saying, you've got this wrong, have you not read this, and la la la. And because he's quite a well-known journalist, they were like, okay, noted. So he's a perfect example of a champion that we've created just through this positive interaction. And he uses the web to share it. The same for Kathy Newman at Channel 4. After an interaction, she wrote a really sympathetic piece in The Telegraph, which is, again, not your usual trans-friendly newspaper. Um, and she gets it completely right, and she references us, the, 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 or the thing with us. Other successes is that Radio 1 first trans presenter, Paris Lees, she's one of our facilitators, and she just made a, an impression, and they realized they need more trans people on the radio. Uh, we have people blogging about it on places like Mumsnet, so we make sure that mums of trans people blog on Mumsnet, so we're kind of reaching as wide an audience as possible. And we get spreads in the Observer and stuff like this. But this is journalists coming to us asking us instead of us campaigning to them. So it's a very different thing from waving your fist and saying you're doing it wrong. It's a very constructive way of going about it. And this is the website that has all the interactions on it. So just to finish, um, here are some of our, our sorry stats from the interactions. So 70% of the journalists keep in touch with volunteers. 60% produce content or plan to 70% have introduced us to a colleague. So we've got a very, in terms of, if you, if you talk about trying to influence a journalist, these stats are really high, you know, whereas usually you can send a journalist 100 emails and they might pick up on one or two. Um, so finally, our next phase, what we want to do and what we've got funding to do is to work with young trans people across the UK. And what we want to do is see if we can actually um, kickstart a movement something like the Dreamers movement. And the Dreamers movement was uh, a movement in the US for young migrants, where young people all across the country started coming out as illegal. And no, there was no one central organizer, but lots of young people had their own websites and Facebook pages, etc. And what we want to do is help to kickstart that and bring together some of the good work that's already being done across the country by uh, involving 100 young people in the next year to organize their own interactions with local media. So that's going to happen from October till the following uh, year. Um, and hopefully then, once enough people are doing enough positive things, there'll be even more momentum around this area because we really feel like it's one of the issues that, you know, it's not good enough that the media hasn't taken uh, more of an interest until now. 
And that is it. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Would you have any questions? Hmm? Hi. We'll just have a conversation. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.